about that. And then I have some more quotes. Um, let me just talk about the dude. Did anyone get to that point in the article about the dude? The dude, okay. If you go to page 529, um, it's kind of important because it's actually, this is a, a misunderstanding of the word dude that kind of circulates in the world and I think it's just interesting to distinguish it. We think dude is what? What do we think of dude? I mean, the definition's up there on the bottom part, but just as a conversation piece, if I say, oh, what a dude. A white heterosexual man, right? And we think it's aligned with what subcultures? Dudes. Sorry? Sports. Sports, surfing, skating, right? We think of like dudes, we think of California. So you may think of California, right? You think of like American slang. The word origin comes from, it's actually from German, and it's um, from German settlers in the United States who saw these Americans who were heading out west to Texas and California, and were like these big land prospectors who were making lots of money really quick and buying like bigger and bigger hats and cooler boots, and they were kind of making themselves up. And the Germans were making fun of them and calling them dudes, and that's where the term came from. And then they began, it was this, like dude ranch and dude hand, and it became an inside word amongst that culture. But um, in this instance, on page 549, George Simmel is using the dude in the traditional sense, um, and he uses, I think it's on, I have the quote up here. Um, we can probably we'll just read this one. While fashion postulates a certain amount of general acceptance, and nevertheless is without signification, in the characterization of the individual, for it emphasizes his personality, not only through omission, but also through observance. In the dude, the social demands of fashion appear exaggerated to such a degree that they com completely, oh, sorry, I don't know if that's mistyped, Indiv individualistic and particular character. It is characteristic of the dude that he car carries the elements of particular fashion to the extreme. So, basically a fashionista, but in the male terminology, um, which is associated with what other word, or what other concept about male fashion? The dandy. The dandy, yes. And so can you go to the next image? Um, which is, as we're talking so much about sort of women distinguishing themselves, we're like, oh, you know, there's all these uniforms and there's men wearing suits. Um, we can't also go forward without acknowledging that there are men who are very invested in their fashion and it's not always homosexual, it can be heterosexual, the metrosexual, right? So guys that are really invested, and the um, old, older term is the dandy, this is from an editorial that was from the New York Times Magazine, um, which was a suits editorial and sort of men very invested um, in suits and vests and coats also. Um, because we might think, oh, all suits look the same, but not if you're wearing a really good one. Not if it was tailored, not if it's special. You know, if you had your jacket made, it better look different, right? So there are men that are very particular as well. And then there's an editorial, um, which actually is a German editorial called The Dude, um, which is more about hipsters, basically, right? Because there are a lot of hipster men that really care about what they're wearing too, right? And a hipster is a generalization, of course, because, you know, the only thing you can't do about hipster is actually speak about it because it can't be spoken about, because it's not, it doesn't exist, no one is a hipster, right? So, but, this sort of contemporary youth culture, or whatever, um, you can go forward, that is, as we said earlier, about sort of slumming it in a way, right? Not trying to look polished, not trying to impress, but trying to kind of subtly layer um, and show a femininity, things like that, okay? Go forward, keep going, keep going. All right, um, okay, and then this is also just an important point to make from page 549, I'll let you guys read it. So, how, how do you suggest we transcend the dialectic? Mm, well, what do you mean? Well, in, in this quote it seems even and consciously being aware of what's going on in the other, in this case, those who choose to engage in fashion, you're still um, trapped in um, that. I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, this quote is prompting the idea that, like, no one can be checked out, 
right? There are people that are checked out of fashion that live every day of their life without ever, I mean, there are people that have probably walked by this and never once, their whole life. I'm sure there's someone in here who's never opened a book. Someone? Okay. So, you've never once opened it. You've never once maybe thought about, hmm, what do they have to say? And, and that's a legitimate thing. There are people who legitimately are disconnected from the fashion system, which is sustaining the ideology of meaning of clothes, right? So, do I, I don't well, has, really it, even dialogue this. has a very real impact. Sorry, I'm sorry? It nonetheless has a very real impact on that individual's life who may have not been exposed to yes. fashion. Yes, you sound like Anna Wintour in the movie, what was it, The Devil Wars Potter, where she says, has anyone seen this, there's this great clip where this girl is being interviewed and she's a real journalist and she's like, I don't care about fashion and I care about ideas. And then Anna Wintour says, what did you know? The blue, does anyone know the scene? Yeah, the, the blue sweater comes the, from the, the blue was picked out by, some, by a designer and then it trickled down to be selected by the department store and so she really... Yes. It really was chosen by the editor. Yes. And so the exact thing that you are wearing came from this ideology of meaning. But it's it's interesting because even with like if you think about idolatry and sort of the system of meaning, not ideology, but idolatry. I mean nothing holds power over you until you rank its importance, right? So if you don't rank the importance of the system of meaning, then wearing the clothes, you're not necessarily carrying that loaded meaning with it. Um, so I don't see that there's a dialectic. I think that this quote's interesting because Simmel's acknowledging there are a lot of people who think that they're completely disconnected or checked out from fashion, but the reality is, um, and I wouldn't say that here are these same people that are, you know, like I think of my grandfather who just passed at 100, and, you know, I don't even think he ever even thought about fashion, really, truly, and really in any deep way. It was not something that he dwelled on. Um, he's talking about people who tried to go against it. People who are like, I hate fashion, people who care about clothes, I'm going to wear a white t-shirt like Steve Jobs. Well, guess what? When Steve Jobs tried not to be fashiony, he established a, an inverse code, right? So, okay. Did you have um, Just the book uh, Pattern Recognition by William Yes, has a exactly. character who tries to wear, who removes all the um, marks of, all the branding marks, and tries to wear clothes that could be from any time. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. But what a hug could or move. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> it's very Carl Lagerfeld. <laughs> okay, who is the designer of Chanel, if you don't know. Okay, who Carl Lagerfeld is really funny because he tries to do things like just like that. And we may have a few minutes to catch a glimpse, hopefully, and maybe we can of Lagerfeld Confidential. I don't know if anybody's seen it where you see this man who's collecting collars from like, you know, the 19th century that he wears, and these rings from the 18th century, and then he's like, you know, he's all over the place, he's very similar. Um, I wanted to just move forward before we go to lunch and just get into some more photography, um, and I hope you can go back and read it if you've not, but on page 552 he talks about the issue of modesty, which is extremely important because he calls out the fact that it's a triumph of soul. I mean, this is a huge concept for this man to throw into this sociological article to basically say that the only people who maybe perhaps are succeeding past this dialectic are those who have higher um, reasoning about a sense of modesty. It's almost as if like when um, in the Yamamoto documentary, they were, he was saying in that clip that, that Yamamoto was inspired by people who had a distinguished attitude about their work. Maybe people who have this distinguished attitude about clothing being modest and being something that is of um, quality and is not about this kind of idea. It can still be valued, but not valued for fashion sense, yes. But part of the problem is that um, it's not necessarily just the person themselves, the way they dress, that creates this fashion, but the way we see people. So mm -hmm. if we look at it from the way Steve Jobs dressed, he was trying to be modest and not trying to create a fashion style, but that ended up becoming a fashion style because of the way people saw him. Right, so. Yeah, it goes back to that, like looking through the lens of the sociologist versus understanding the human expression that we have. So that kind of way of seeing. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So moving forward. So these are some um, Celine. We'll talk a little bit about this as well. Certain brands, like because every brand has an aura, right? And so Celine has an aura that in the fashion world is of this like extremely modest, like a skirt that's very, it could be, you know, so simple that it's no brand, or it could be a Celine brand and it's thousands of dollars. And so the idea is to enter that realm of um, silence, 
where it's talking about you know being loud. And also some of the Antwerp 6 designers have some pieces like that, and Yamamoto have some pieces like that, that are so well designed, they, and they are so high quality, but they are virtually silent, and you would never notice or give recognition to the piece of design. And the ads as well, what's interesting is that what they're doing, this is a campaign from 2010, and they're also doing it now, which is No Heads, right? Which is a great visual media communication of the sense of, we're going to be silent, we're going to be anybody. We can be anyone's clothes, in a way, right? Um, okay, I think that's, this is the last one. Um, we don't need to go into this, because I want to make sure we get to the bars before lunch. Um, basically, if you look at the very end of the article, he says something really great, um, which is this a whole idea of, the idea of an appearance of duration. That when something comes out, when the newest thing is out, and this is so true, of even like an Apple product or a car, which is the sense of fashionability. When the newest thing is out, you feel like it's going to last forever, right? And that's that side of fashion that has that appearance of endurance, which is something we talked about earlier um, with contemporary versus present, which we talked about that idea, which is so essential. Like it can, the contemporary thing feels that it will always be present. And, and what Simmel acknowledges very specifically is this exact line. Some fashion always exists, and fashion per se is indeed immortal. So it's like fashion itself, the idea of human expression with style and with design, is always going to be part of humanity. It's not going anywhere. And so when something's very fashionable, it aligns with the eternal. And there's something magical about that that like appeals to us on some level. Um, okay. And that's at the conclusion, that's within the article. Alright, so I just want to move ahead to the BART because I think it's important um, to talk about Roland BART's take on fashion photography. Um, so, does anyone want to borrow my printed essay? Or you can access it in the blog, does anyone need it? Do you? Okay. I'll just start. Thank you. Alright, so what's the story? You can share what Roland Bard had to say in two pages about fashion photography. Very short, yes. I, I can at least try. My understanding of it was that fashion photography sort of signifies the inability to signify, so it sort of signifies the unreal. And in doing so, it sort of puts the signification in quotes and then sort of allows the garment to signify because all signification becomes unreal. All signification, to a certain extent, is imaginary, <coughs> or is in the realm of fantasy, in the realm of that sort of realm of ideology of thinking that's being sustained, yes. And fashion photography isolates the signifiers. Yes, good, well said. Okay, so how does it do that? I just noticed on the blog for some reason it's saying that it expires. I think I I posted it like three weeks ago and it's reached its I'll repost it. One of the things that really struck me is he talked about everything becoming outrageous so that the clothing is the only thing that becomes real. Exactly. That's a great so that's a good support there. Because basically the signifier, okay, so the, the the meaning that's communicated by a particular clothing item is what's happening. We're getting that meaning somehow out of the photograph. Like when we were looking at the Celine photos, those were oh skirts, right? We're understanding that. But in an editorial, there's a process, and he describes it as an exorcism. What is the exorcism of a fashion photograph? I think it's exactly what Justin just said about yeah. the brackets that are placed around the environment in order for the garment to be for, to occupy a foreground in the imaginal like, space of the viewer. Yes, so he makes everything that's not within the brackets seem, the word he uses, outrageous, or seem unsensible. Right? So that's why we have these sort of radical photographs. Like, what do you remember about the Stephen Mizell that we just looked at, besides like, all of the models? You, there were a few dresses. Like, you know, there were scenes, right? But the scene is so outrageous that you look at the individual that's being focused on. You look at the person. Can you go forward? And so that's the exact idea, right? It's the, so that the world um, is photographed as a background. And he's transforming these environments into a theater, or she, the, the, the photographer, the fashion photographer, is treating the environment like a theater. So 
it's imaginary in an editorial or an ad, for example. Here again is Stephen Meisel. Um, can we go forward? And this is actually another editorial by him called The Greatest Show on Earth. Um, I guess I moved it too high. So within the signifying decor, the woman seems to live, um, and she is within the scene. So here again, the scene is kind of outrageous. We look at the dress. We're also looking at the person on the right in this case, and then go forward. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yes. Sorry, just for a moment. I don't want to break for lunch, but yeah. it isn't, I mean, isn't one of the operative ironies that the fashion that contains, that is of interest, is operating in the background of these things? Um, you know, I'm using myself today as a starter because I find, I find that he's one of, he is like the David Lynch of fashion photography, and so yeah. I, I think his photos are very rich. Yeah. I think it's subjective, and I think that Bart identifies three styles of photographs that are very common. Um, does anyone remember what they are? Okay, <laughs> yes? Uh, romanticized, representational, and mockery. Yes, and so it's interesting because I actually have taught this essay and this idea, and I've read all of Bart's fashion system, and it's funny because he says that, so for example, like this photo. This is a representative, representative, objective photo, right? We have a woman in a jacket. She's a famous woman. We have a woman in a jacket, right? So this type of photo, the objective, is the first one he calls out. He goes, open a catalog. It, it's, it's objective. And in this case, um, it's easy to say that the clothing is foregrounded. Um, and then in the secondary example, um, he says romantic. So if you imagine like a woman on a beach, again, you might be drawn through the romantic environment to look at the clothing. The third is the one that I find the most fascinating, which is mockery. Um, which I find is the culture jamming one, the one that goes opposite to the system, which kind of is like mocking the system of fashion itself, right? And I find it to be the most critical type of fashion photography because if we're talking about fashion as the system of meaning that's being sustained, then it is the photographers that are mocking the system that are the ones that are kind of prompting people who, if they're unconscious of this sort of spectacle, then they're looking at the images and they're sort of like, oh, that's weird and crazy. Fashion's so weird and crazy. But if there are people who are more conscious, and I think Mizell is one example because he doesn't get interviews and he's very strategic and he only works with certain magazines. You know, he knows what he's doing. And there's a synthesis in his photographs of all three. Some of his photographs are very literal. Some of them are romantic. Some of them are more mocking. And so I think these are harder to say um, are static. And also, when Bart was writing in the 1960s, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of variety <laughs> of photographs. Um, so these are a little bit different um, in terms of visual examples. But um, you can go forward. There's some more um, here. Um, like here in this case, you're definitely seeing the dress. I mean, there's no question. Um, so I think it's a very subjective thing. Keep going. Okay. All right. And then this is, I think, the most interesting part um, is that, you know, he, that idea that we're talking about, the signifier. Um, he says the quote on page 518 that nothing plausible remains in the photo except the garment. And almost to calling um, fashion editorials unsolved mysteries, it's interesting. When I was like very young, like an adolescent, I can remember like looking through, you know, these types of magazines and looking at an editorial and thinking like, hmm, like I never verbalized it, but like where was this? Why did this happen? Was this like, oh, it's just a part of something. An editorial is such a weird thing because it's not a full story. It's not even a story. We don't even know who these people are, but we somehow accept in our society that we circulate these photos of fragments of people that are anonymous wearing clothes and kind of doing things and then not finishing it. Like what, what is that, right? And it's a very bizarre accepted thing in, in fashion media that we have these fragments of meaning that are very loaded and intense, but are meaningless, are totally meaningless. These models never see each other again, the photographer leaves, he goes home you know, to his cats, and the stylist goes home, whatever. People live their lives, they never get together again. And I've worked on fashion shoots, and it's like, it's crazy, it's like nobody cares. People just, they take the photographs and they move on, and these things are so loaded, and they feel so strong, but they don't have the, the feeling behind them that maybe a documentary might, or a film even. Um, so I have some visual examples of some editorials that are more conscious of this. Um, this is an interesting photographer. This is Stephen Klein, not Mizell, it's a different Stephen. Um, and he is also very, does not really give interviews, a very private person. Um, he really photographs a lot of celebrities. And this is one editorial um, from Vogue US um, that was, gave that feeling of something's going on, but it's not being explained. So can you, so well for you just give for like a few seconds to each shot. Um, like obviously she's doing something, 
but we don't know what she's doing. And you know, the, the, the color tones of the images, the way that it's been processed, it's very kind of, it feels old, but yes. No, I've been having this question for a while, that there's these narrative implications, but that term is not used. Yes. And you're kind of explaining it now that there's this fragmentation, and the narrative is, is incomplete. And now you're explaining from the back side, it's, it's incomplete as well. Oh. Yeah. I mean, and you had asked, I think it was Maya maybe that asked how it works operationally, right, in, in terms of putting together a shoot or something like that. But it's, I mean, and, and with Mizell, it, it's more involved, and there's some that are more involved. But in most instances, it's like we have some clothes, we're going to come up with a concept, like we're going to shoot it, and it's going to be put together um, without much answer. But this, I mean, here she's like holding mail and money, can you go forward, suitcase, very mysterious. Um, running to a car, and also it kind of gets that voyeur photographer, like we were talking which end of the spectrum, right? Like, are you looking on this end, or are you looking on that end? And fashion photography is definitely looking at people from almost that sociological lens, and in this case, almost like a paparazzi or something, or maybe a, a surveillance. And then this one was called, this is by Terry Richardson, you may know him, he likes to photograph himself quite a bit. Um, Terry Richardson for Vogue Nippon, which is um, Japan, if you don't know. Um, called the untold crowd. Can you hold here for one second? So if you go back just to the previous image, um, this this would have been very um, thought out extremely. And in this case, because this is a copy of Clute, which I don't know if anyone's ever seen Clute. It's a Jane Fonda film, um, and so they did the styling. So in this case, the photographer is working with a stylist, and their concept is to use Jane Fonda. You can go to the next one. Um, so Jane Fonda served, she happened to have a haircut similar, and so they got this model, we said we're going to use this film as the narrative for the editorial, etc. So, um, but it just happened to be called The Untold Crime, and so they introduced things like phone calls, of course, who's using a payphone anymore, um, this kind of old-fashioned 70s feel to it, car rides to nowhere, picking up things, like kind of out, that meaningless is heightened, and meaninglessness is heightened in this editorial. I mean, she could be going shopping, right? But it just kind of feels... Oh, and then it ends with, this is the last image of the editorial, like as if she's a prostitute, which is the part of the story clued. And then this is another one by Ellen von Unworth for Vogue Italia, called, um, and in which she did these... Um, I forget what they're called. What's it called? The... Cross-cross. The, the cross-bars. Or the... Cross-hairs. Cross-hairs, yes. On the models. Um, again, communicating that sense of surveillance, voyeurism, um, you know, and then this was the last um, two pages of the editorial where it looks, again, like she's been followed by a private investigator, um, et cetera. So it's, uh, these are interesting to me because I think it heightens that sense which we already feel with, um, just you can stop there for one second, um, the heightens the sense we already feel that we're voyeur, voyeurs when we're looking at fashion photography, you know, or a sense of we're watching people. Um, predator, predator, predatorial, definitely. Okay, so we have 15 minutes. <laughs> I am going to quickly tell you guys about the history of fashion photography in the last 15 minutes. It's crazy, we have 15 minutes. I'm going to do it because I'm just going to mention the key names, because for the rest of the time, we'll see examples from those photographers, and I think you should know a little bit of them. So I'll just jump through the most significant ones um, for the rest of our classes so you know. Um, and fashion photography, where it started, um, fashion photography began with Castiglione. She was a countess. And her closet was so overabundant that she came up with this idea with her friend, Pierre Louis Pearson. And she said, let's take pictures of everything. Wouldn't that be a fun idea? And so they did. They took a picture of everything in her closet, and that's where fashion photography established itself. Um, it became such a popular thing amongst that circle of people. So anyway, that's where it started. And then it became more of an art following that with more serious studio photographers who took it up um, as a form of media for catalogs and magazines. Um, you don't have to worry about these early, early names. Baron de Meyer, um, and most of the early fashion photographers, by the way, have like either Baron names or a lot of them were, were knighted and were um, kind of of an upper echelon because printing and photography was very expensive. So it wasn't something very common um, really until the 1940s. Um, so Baron de Meyer, and these are, this is what early fashion photography looked like, not so different um, from the photography we see today. Here's an early ad for Elizabeth Arden from 1930, which I find really kind of unusual. Um, but anyway, so you get the feeling. And then Steichen and Stieglitz, who you may know, right, from other photography. And so this is um, this idea when sort of prominent photographers begin to step into it. Um, worked with Condé Nast. So Condé Nast, um, really, which is 
unfortunately now with the internet, I don't know, their reign is going to come to an end, but the empire of Condé Nast, of course, which we may know, which is producer of all the common magazines that you can think of, from Vogue to GQ to Fanny Fair, etc., the major magazines. Condé Nast, which started in the early 1900s, had these studio photographers come in and really give them really great photography to re replace illustration. This is Steichen, one of Condé Nast's most famous photos, which ran in Vogue in 1928. Um, these are um, additional Steichen um, photographs, just give you an example of the studio effect. They felt like those very like glamoury shots, um, most of them done indoors, the one on the left, um, or the one on the left and on the landscape. And then, like shoes, make the shoes magical with lighting and with studio effects was sort of the sensibility of early Condé Nast. Um, as well as celebrities, Gloria Swanson and Marlene Dietrich on the right. Um, and then Honey Ming Hyun um, was from St. Petersburg, and then he got into the scene of fashion photography in Paris. Um, and he's really famous for establishing these very clean shots that focused on the clothes. A great minimalist, he worked for Lacoste. Um, and he also photographed athletes and dancers. Um, these were done for the cost, though, very simple and minimalist. Um, and he also um, worked a lot with dancers and theater. A horse view horse um, worked with dancers also. He worked with Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. Um, these early ones we won't be talking about so much. This is Martin Mikhazy. You cannot see his name, I'm sorry. Um, but he actually was a Hungarian Jew and he was living um, in Germany. Um, during 1934, um, he had to leave, and he went and worked for Harper's Bazaar, and um, these are images he shot. He's super interesting and influential. Martin Mikhazy, there was a show of his stuff in France last year. He is much more influenced by surrealism than a lot of those studio photographers were. Um, instead of the high lights, um, etc., he's more interested in abstraction, and he's influential to Guy Debord. Um, and this is Cecil Beaton. Um, he was in a certain circle of people in the UK, you may know his name. He photographed a lot of celebrities. He worked a lot for Vanity Fair and for Vogue in the early days. And he did kind of crazy things like this. Lots of um, interesting backgrounds. Sorry we have to rush through these. And then he was sort of the one who established this idea of a sainted photographer for the royal family, which Mario Testino now is. But Cecil Beaton did the, um, sorry, the coronation uh, photo of Queen Elizabeth. And then he also started photographing this whole London scene, um, which I want to show you a clip of. Which, let's just jump ahead to that, actually, because these photographers, this is all online. You can see it if you go to our blog on the right-hand side, the history of fashion photography on the right-hand side. But I'll just point out a couple of important ones. Um, Erwin Blumenfield um, was somebody who was worked with graphic designers and worked with both Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and was really influenced by surrealism. And I have a short clip of him, which I'm going to show you. And then um, the other one I want to mention, this is, maybe I should just do this after lunch before we start, is, sorry, is um, David Bailey, who is known for the London scene. So let me show you those two clips. They're each like two minutes. Um, what time is it? Oh, 51. 51. So let me show